Hello and welcome to the 538 Politics Podcast. I'm Galen Druk. The countdown begins. Election Day is exactly two weeks from today. And as Jody mentioned yesterday, we're going to be putting out more or less daily podcasts from here on out. And we'll be joined by various 538 writers and contributors focusing on different aspects of the election. And today we are zooming in on voting laws. Since 2016, states have passed both new requirements and measures that make it easier to vote. Here with me to discuss those are 538 contributors Amelia thompson DeVoe. Hey, Amelia. Hi, Galen. And Dan Hopkins. Hi, Dan. Hi, Galen. Amelia covers the courts, and listeners, you are certainly familiar with her from all of the Supreme Court coverage we have been doing so far this year. Dan is a political science professor at the University of Pennsylvania and writes for 538. So let's get into it, you guys. To set the scene a bit, new voting restrictions in states with competitive races like Georgia and North Dakota in particular have been under the spotlight recently. There are also states that have passed new laws making it easier to vote through automatic registration and mail-in ballots. And there are also new voting laws up for a vote on ballots around the country this year. So there's a lot to cover here. Voting laws can be complex. And by the nature of having different voting laws across different states, there's lots of different things to study. And maybe we don't have answers for how every law affects every state, but we're going to do our best. Let's begin with the controversy in Georgia. Amelia, can you give us the lay of the land of what's going on there? There's been a lot of controversy in Georgia over a law that was passed last year that's being called an exact match law. It requires that all of the letters and the numbers of the applicant's name and other information you put on a voter registration application, so your date of birth, your driver's license number, all of that has to exactly match the same letters and numbers that are stored in the DMV database or the Social Security database. And so what this means is, you know, I have a hyphenated last name, which is certainly the bane of my existence when (laughs) filling out forms. Um, And sometimes, you know, I might forget to put the hyphen in my last name, someone else filling out the form for me might do that. If there's a hyphen in the driver's license, the DMV database, but not one on my voter registration form, then this means there is not an exact match between the two of them. And hypothetically, if this happened, I were trying to register to vote in Georgia, my file would be placed on pending status until it's corrected. And because, you know, we all know when filling out forms, there's enormous potential for human error. There have been some analyses showing that tens of thousands of people who believe they registered to vote or may believe they registered to vote are on this pending list. And according to these analyses, the vast majority of those people are people of color. So there's been a lot of controversy about that particular law in Georgia. Yeah, I think it was something like 50,000 people were in this sort of voter registration purgatory, and 70% of those people were African American. Dan, what's the logic behind these laws? Are they common? And what effects do they have? Here, the challenge is that states are tasked with managing their own voter records. Every state in the nation except uh, North Dakota has voter registration. So voters, in order to, to vote, have to be registered to do so. Then there's the question of how do states manage their voter rolls? And the truth is that states manage their voter rolls in very different ways. I myself have lived as an adult in a wide range of states. And I know that some states are very, very quick when I leave them to get me off the voter rolls. And other states, you know, there's a, a state that I haven't voted in or lived in in more than a decade. And I, I know I remain on the rolls there. One question is, how do we make sure that a voter is, is a specific individual? And what rules do we have for a valid registration? There's a separate but related question, which is that in recent years, some states have begun to use programs to try to identify voters who may be registered in multiple places or multiple states and to remove their registrations. This is all a product of concern, primarily almost exclusively from the Republican Party, that our voter rolls have a large number of inactive voters, and that there are some people who are registered to vote and could potentially 
be voting in multiple elections, only some of which they're eligible to vote in. And so the ways that particular states are keeping their voter rolls up to date has become somewhat of a controversy again in Georgia. I'm looking at an American public media analysis that said that 107,000 Georgians were removed from the voter rolls because they hadn't voted in past elections and were more accustomed to people being taken off the voter rolls because they moved, died, or went to prison. Why is this the way that they're keeping up the voter rolls in Georgia? This is interesting because I, I wrote a story for 538 earlier this year about a practice in Ohio that is similar. People were removed from the voter rolls if they didn't vote in a couple of election cycles and then they didn't respond to a notice saying that, you know, you haven't voted in a couple of election cycles. Do you still live at this address? And the issue is, you know, you want up to date voter rolls. And as Dan mentioned, It can be hard to tell when people have moved. People often don't let the state know, you know, I'm leaving the state or I'm into a different part of the state. So when I was talking to officials in Ohio, they were saying not voting in a few elections could, and then not responding to this notice, could conceivably be a proxy for this person has moved, this person is sort of no longer eligible to vote at this address. On the other hand, critics say, you know, yes, it's challenging to keep voter rolls up to date, but you really shouldn't do it this way because you're essentially removing people, not because they move, not because you have proof that they're ineligible to vote in that particular location, but they're they're simply being removed because they're exercising their right not to vote. And the Ohio procedure for updating the rolls was actually upheld by the Supreme Court in June. And it's a sort of similar thing that's happening in Georgia. A registered voter is flagged um, to be removed if they don't vote or make contact with election officials. So signing a, a petition, something like that, for three years. Then they get a notice. It sort of, sort of takes place over about seven years. And the reason that a lot of people were removed from the rolls in 2017 was because people who voted in 2008, which was very high turnout, and then skipped 2010 through 2016, got taken off the rolls in 2017. So we're seeing a lot of people getting removed. And, you know, it, it, it really is, I mean, I think it, it highlights that the challenges of maintaining voter rolls, but again, critics are, you know, are saying basically people should, people have the right not to vote. And of course, the people who are less likely to vote regularly in, um, especially in midterm elections, are people of color. So again, this sort of has a disproportionate effect on certain voters. So states are charged with administering elections, keeping updated voter rolls, as we've mentioned. But how do we, of course, the question becomes, like, how do we tell when states are acting in good faith to ensure the integrity of our elections and when these are becoming partisan or racially motivated laws that essentially work to suppress the vote? I mean, is there is there a good way to tell? In in a few cases, there's smoking gun evidence. Every once in a while, there will be emails that make disparate racial or disparate partisan impacts the clear motivation. But I think the question is a great one because in a lot of instances, do we judge based on the the law's impacts? Do we judge based on the presumed intent? Do we judge based on the stated intent? And that, I think, a number of these court cases ultimately hinge on on those issues. It's often very difficult to prove that there was racial animus or, you know, even if a law has a disproportionate impact on a certain group of voters, it's not necessarily um, illegal. And I think one, one of the things we're seeing also this year is that five years ago, the Supreme Court essentially removed federal oversight over many communities that under the Voting Rights Act were required to basically run changes to their election system by the Department of Justice because they had a history of discriminating against minorities. And the Supreme Court in 2013 basically said, you know, we've moved really far past 
the 1960s, these communities, we can trust them to update their um, election procedures. And so, you know, one of the things that we're seeing is that in many of these communities, some polling places are closing, you know, some of these changes that have been made, something like the exact match procedure might have been flagged under this Voting Rights Act procedure that the Supreme Court has now removed. I want to get to North Dakota, which is another state that has been under the spotlight in recent weeks for voting laws. But I also I just want to get this out there because I'm sure people listening have in mind this message that part of ensuring electoral integrity is making sure there's no voter fraud. And that's kind of been a talking point for implementing a lot of the laws that we're going to be discussing in this podcast. What evidence is there of voter fraud in America? The evidence is that it is a very, very, very rare occurrence. And I think it's also important to note that the kind of election fraud that almost all the measures that we've been and I think we'll talk about um, are targeted not just at election fraud generally, but at a very particular type of election fraud, which is voter impersonation and often in-person voter impersonation. And that is exceedingly rare. I think um, you know one person had looked into it and identified that there were potentially something like 35 instances of what seemed quite likely to be actual in-person you know, voter fraud of different kinds. So I think that what we know is that um, in-person voter fraud is, is exceedingly rare. And thus, one of the questions has to be, how many um, legitimate voters are we willing to disenfranchise in the elimination of something that seems exceedingly rare um, in the first place? Voter fraud is extremely rare. But we do we do know that we have extremely low voter turnout in the country. And so one of the concerns, you know, is that if there are all of these restrictions or sort of it's, it's harder for people to vote, the lines are long at polling places because there are fewer polling places, fewer people will turn out and vote. And so, you know, it's sort of exactly what Dan was saying. How, how do we weigh, you know, a problem that seems to not be common against something where we know that very few people do turn out to vote um, relative to other democracies, especially in the midterms? And so how do, you know, people who push for these laws square that, square the evidence with pursuing more requirements for voting? You know, it's it, it's a little bit of a tough question because I think they're they're not they're kind of not engaging with the evidence in the way that we might. I think their perspective is that any potential voter fraud is a problem, and you know we have to take the steps that we need to take. I, I know certainly that judges have pointed out in various rulings about these different laws and procedures that voter fraud is, you know, I mean, I mean, pretty much non-existent. I think politicians just kind of aren't, aren't engaging with that in the same way. And I probably would say, and as I have written a little bit about voter ID laws, I will sometimes then get public reactions where people say that the requirements to get a public ID are not especially onerous. So that's one line of defense that I hear, that the administrative burdens that it takes to get an ID are often, you know, I think proponents of these laws would argue not, not especially burdensome. Right. And I mean, that's another argument, too, you know, with something like um, being removed from the voter roll because of not voting in an election. You know, they'll say, you know, we send we send people a postcard. We just ask them to send it back. You know, it's not a huge burden on the people who are living there to to just see a postcard in the mail from the state and return it to us. So I think that that's another argument that comes up. So let's turn to North Dakota, which is, of course, where Republican Kevin Kramer is running to unseat Democrat Heidi Heitkamp. And the debate there involves a specific provision of their voter ID law. Amelia, do you want to give us some background on that? So I think Dan mentioned earlier that North Dakota is unusual in that it doesn't register voters. So the Republican controlled state government has said, you know, we need a voter ID requirement to make sure that we're, you know, connecting voters with the correct ballot. 
to prevent non-North Dakota residents from um, coming into the state and voting fraudulently, you know, maybe setting up a P.O. box. And so under the requirement, North Dakotans can't vote unless they have identification that shows their name, their birth date, and a residential address. And um, this is something that many people on on Native American reservations have raised concerns about um, because they don't have residential addresses. They use P.O. boxes. Native Americans are also overrepresented among the homeless population, so they might, you know, not have a residential address for that reason. And there had been a lot of litigation over this, and the Supreme Court just allowed it to take effect after the lower courts had blocked it. So there are concerns both about sort of, you know, the the broader effects on Native Americans in the state, but then also being able to communicate what the requirements are with just a few weeks left before the election. I think that given the context that Amelia just talked about, the fact that there isn't voter registration in North Dakota, it's somewhat of of a different case. But what I will say is that generally, you know, we often talk about voter ID laws as if they are one kind of law implemented with one purpose. And in fact, they just they vary extraordinarily. And I think often, as I have delved into this somewhat, I've realized that the devil is often in the details and that very, very minor questions about, for instance, what happens when a voter arrives without ID can actually be crucial in assessing the, the impact of these laws. Yeah. And so with the two instances that we just talked about, both in Georgia with registrations being held up and the voter ID issue in North Dakota. If you're in voter registration purgatory or if you don't have uh, an ID that gives a residential address, I mean, can you still vote? Are these serving as total impediments to vote or do you just file a provisional ballot and, you know, that can still be counted later on? Well, so in, in Georgia, with the, the issue where a lot of people had been put on pending status because of the exact match provision, um, they should be able to show up and vote if they can provide some kind of ID that matches their voter registration. And, you know, you, you, you are, in theory, supposed to be able to cast a provisional ballot. One of the issues is that poll workers do have really wide discretion over what happens at polling places. And so I think, you know, there have been some concerns that people who might be eligible for a provisional ballot um, or might be able to vote based on the ID that they've brought are sometimes not allowed to because there's confusion among poll workers and the requirements aren't clear to them. So that's another wrinkle. It's sort of like there's the law and then there's what happens at the polling place. And the law is, you know, sometimes not not even communicated as effectively as it could be to the people who are actually in charge of administering it. I think that's a really great point. You know, I've spent many, many elections in different precincts. And I think Amelia is entirely right that what poll workers know and their approach to policies can really can vary a lot. I think the other thing that I'd say is that it's really important to distinguish what happens with provisional ballots. Uh, For instance, in Virginia, voters who cast provisional ballots then need to reappear at a board of elections within, I think it's about three days, um, and show proper ID for that provisional ballot to be counted. So a provisional ballot is not initially a vote in Virginia unless you take additional steps. However, in Michigan, if you certify that you, you know, if you file an affidavit, you can then vote and have your vote included along with anybody else. And so I think that, again, um, a lot hinges both on specific state laws and on implementation, what poll workers instruct voters who are confused. All right. I want to broaden out the conversation to talk about how voting laws around the country have changed in recent years and what we know about measuring those effects. But before we do that, a word from this episode's sponsor, ZipRecruiter. Hiring is a challenge, but there's one place you can go where hiring is simple, fast, and smart. A place where growing businesses connect to qualified candidates. And that place is ZipRecruiter.com slash 538. ZipRecruiter sends your job to over 100 of the web's leading job boards, but they don't stop there. With their powerful matching technology, ZipRecruiter scans thousands of resumes to find people with the right experience and invite them to apply to your job. As applications come in, ZipRecruiter analyzes each one and spotlights the top candidates so you never miss a great match. ZipRecruiter is so effective that 80% of employers who post on ZipRecruiter get a quality candidate through the site within the first day. 
With results like that, it's no wonder that ZipRecruiter is the highest rated hiring site in America. And right now, listeners can try ZipRecruiter for free at ZipRecruiter.com slash 538. That's ZipRecruiter.com slash 538. ZipRecruiter, the smartest way to hire. Let's continue our conversation, and we're going to zoom out from Georgia and North Dakota and look at the country as a whole. Is it possible for us to quantify, you know, historically or relative to past decades, how much voting laws have changed recently? Yeah, that's a good question. And I mean, I think one of the key things to keep in mind here is that there is a long history of a wide range of voting laws that very effectively disenfranchised African-Americans. Um, obviously, we know the history in the South, but not exclusively in the South. And so I think that any conversations about the current, you know, the, the last decade or so need to be had with that set of memories involved. And the fact that, you know, a lot of, of our laws around these issues emerge from and in sometimes reaction to the very, very real impediments that effectively disenfranchised millions of American citizens. So uh, what we can say is that in the period, particularly after the Help America Vote Act, and especially in the wake of Indiana's um, voter ID law, um, we have seen, you know, a series of voter ID laws implemented, a a kind of new wave of voter ID laws implemented in a range of states, primarily Republican dominated states. Um, And it's also worth noting, Amelia had earlier mentioned the 2013 um, Shelby County decision and that the removal of preclearance then has led to a new wave of both ID laws, but also other shifts in how uh, elections are administered in the states that were formerly covered by preclearance requirements. And just to note, the Help America Vote Act passed in 2002. So we've been talking about voter ID registration. There are also laws such as automatic voter registration, mail-in ballots, absentee voting, early voting that are designed to make it easier to vote. What has the balance been over the past decade with regard to laws that have made it easier to vote and laws that have added new requirements? Well, I mean, I think I think the really important thing to note is that there's been a pretty big red state, blue state divide. So a lot of states, I mean, I think Washington is a good example. Earlier this year, Washington state's legislature passed a a big bill that included automatic voter registration. It included election day registration. There was pre-registration for 16, 17 year olds. And they and I think they also included a state version of the National Voting Rights Act. And, you know, a a significant number of, of blue states in particular have been sort of making these efforts to make voting easier, to register people when they they come into contact with the DMV. California is, um, this is is the first year that California will be, is registering people um, with their own Motor Voter Act. That's sort of the divide that I've seen. I mean, I also can't really speak to sort of the number of provisions um, and kind of assess it that way, but there's definitely a different attitude toward the sort of kinds of of voting laws and procedures that are perceived to be necessary in red versus blue states. And sort of, I think that's the the big trend and the sort of the divide that is really worth noting. Of course, the big question, and this is something I think we've tried to grapple with a little on the podcast. I know it's a big debate within the, you know, election law academic community, but is measuring the effects of all of these different measures. On one hand, the different states are little like laboratories for democracy, so we can see the impacts of a whole host of laws. Um, You know, this is something that we discussed with the gerrymandering project. On the other hand, we may not have a ton of evidence because all states do it differently. So what do we know so far about the effects of, you know, voter ID, more aggressively updating voter rolls, shortening periods for early voting or, you know, closing polling places. You know, what do we what do we know about the effects of that? So let me just take a couple of those pieces. We certainly know that when you make it harder for people to vote, fewer people vote. There is evidence, for instance, um, from California that when you consolidate precincts, when people have to go farther to get to their new precinct, they're less likely to vote. Because for many people, Voting is a marginal decision, right? For many people, um, they may vote or they may not vote, but whether they vote or not is not going to have powerful and immediate personal consequences for them. 
So marginal decisions are often influenced by relatively small factors either way. So with respect then to what do we know about the impact? Let me, let me talk specifically about voter ID where I think there's a more extensive literature. Galen, you're totally right that on the one hand, it would seem um, natural to just compare states and say, well, we know that Indiana implemented a law in this year and then compare Indiana's turnout before and after. But of course, the central challenge is that the voter ID law wasn't the only thing that changed in Indiana or Wisconsin or any other state. At the same time, there are different candidates on the ballot. And you know, in particular, Barack Obama drew very, very high levels of turnout from the African-American community, which is often disproportionately affected by, um, by voter ID laws. African-Americans are less likely to have some of the forms of ID required by voter ID laws. And so, you know, we could look at shifts from 2012 to 2016 and attribute them potentially to voter ID, but they also could reflect the changing patterns of turnout that are true across states. Um, That said, there have been a number of, I think, really credible studies in particular states, in states like Texas or Michigan or Virginia, states that have changed particular policies and where we can then look and see, okay, how many people actually cast provisional ballots in Virginia in 2014 when they shifted to a strict voter ID policy? Or how many people cast ballots in Texas in 2016 after filling out a declaration stating that they, they didn't have ID? Um, and I think what, what we have seen is that the effects of these policies, so and here I'm again just talking about voter ID policies, is that they can vary with the specifics of the law, but they are um, disproportion. They disproportionately affect poorer voters, older voters, and particularly voters of color, African Americans and Latinos, who are populations who are less likely to have driver's licenses, which is by far the most common uh, form of ID that people use at the polls. Dan, in our last episode of Model Talk, Nate actually mentioned this idea that in the immediate aftermath of a new voting law one that is seen as a restriction or an attempt to suppress the vote, that sometimes the backlash can actually increase turnout amongst the community that perceives that their vote is being suppressed. And we heard from a bunch of listeners who said, you know, what is the academic research on this? Is that backed up by academic research? It is, actually. There there was an article in the Journal of Politics, I think last year, by Nick Valentino uh, and a few co-authors where they demonstrate that effect. And they indeed then argue that in the short term, these laws can galvanize communities. And I would, I would not be surprised if, if you know, American Indian communities in North Dakota are galvanized by the threat to their voting rights. I mean, I think that the franchise has long been contested in American political history and is so central to, you know, when, when the, the civil rights movement was unfolding, it is one of the pillars of their legislative strategy was securing the Voting Rights Act, precisely because voting is so fundamental to citizenship and to political representation in this country. And so I think that, that yes, a lot of voter ID debates, particularly in the short term, can have a galvanizing effect among communities that, that perceive them to be threats and perceive them to be trying to shut down that most fun- fundamental of, of American rights. And then is in the long term, is the picture any different? We don't have long-term data on this, but I think that there's good reason to expect that over the long term that both people will to some degree adapt to the policy, but also, yes, that that initial backlash will fade over time. And so my suspicion is that the long-run effect of some of these voter ID laws may be different than the short-run effect when they are introduced and become part of the political process themselves. They're, They're not just influencing how we're voting, but they're influencing you know, people's motivation to vote in the first place. Amelia, you mentioned a state like Washington that is implementing new policies to make it easier to vote. And so at this point, can we look at the different states that have moved in different directions over the past decade and come to any broader conclusions? Or at this point, we really just have have limited data and limited research? My understanding is that, you know, these laws are fairly new in a lot of states. So I think we're not quite sure what the impact has been. But I I do know in a a state like Oregon, which had implemented some reforms, um, including automatically registering people, motor voters, that the voter turnout was 
I think, fairly high among those folks. And that was sort of seen as a good sign that some of these efforts to make it easier for people to vote or to register people automatically um, were encouraging people, more people to get out. But, you know, I think I think it's just one thing that we'll have to continue to watch. So I can I can certainly say with respect to, to voter ID that there are impacts um, on turnout, but that they tend to be um, relatively small, at least compared to the magnitude of election margins. That is to say, a race would have to be exceedingly tight for a voter ID law to decide who wins. But of course, that's not the only metric on which we should be evaluating these laws, right? We should be evaluating them also on individual constitutional rights. And if you know, if an individual is denied a constitutional right to vote, that in and of itself is a concern, irrespective of whether that individual's vote would have been decisive in an election. On the flip side, so we're talking about reforms that make it easier to vote. And I am I'm more familiar with research on earlier waves of reforms, things like motor voter in the 1990s. Uh, so I think that there are a wide range of reforms and different reforms have different impacts. So for instance, I have research showing that providing ballots in Spanish, as Section 203 of the Voting Rights Act requires in certain jurisdictions, does increase turnout. And, you know, very reasonably, if you have to provide election materials in Spanish and you have a lot of, you know, Spanish dominant U.S. citizens, you would expect that that kind of targeted reform is going to influence turnout, but that other reforms like motor voter have, have in some instances, tended to generate pretty small changes in overall voter turnout. And so so I think that, you know, on a lot of these questions, we can generally say that these policies often are influencing the electorate, but not in dramatic ways. Given that, if, say, Democrats lose the governor's race in Georgia or the Senate race in North Dakota by a slim margin, like, I think we can probably expect that people are going to talk about voter suppression having had an impact in this election. How should we go about assessing that? One of the keys would then be to to look very, very carefully at the data. I think that the most credible studies, and the reason that I'm I'm comfort, much more comfortable talking about some states than others, is that there are some states where we have very, very credible individual level data. And so I think that if the, for instance, the you know the Georgia governor's race were to be razor thin, the challenge is that we would need to see the data. We would need to, to dig into the voter files to try to assess what were some of these effects. And I think one thing that's important to note about Georgia is that, and, and Amelia, please jump in here, um, but my understanding is that for this election, people cannot be denied the right to vote on the basis of these, the changes in registration policies. Amelia, is that right? Yeah. So with the exact match specifically, as long as they show up with some form of identification that substantially matches their registration, they're allowed to vote. You know, whether people know that is another question. Yeah. And that gets that gets into one of the real challenges, because as researchers, we can we can always count things. Right. So we know that in Virginia, when Virginia in 2014 shifted to a strict voter ID law, there were about 500 provisional ballots filed because people showed up at the polls without the right ID. And partly, we think that that number was relatively low because the Virginia um, Department of Elections coordinated to send a mailer to voters they identified as not having a driver's license and let them know about this change and let them know about how to obtain an ID. But you know, in other instances, we've seen numbers of people that would be caught up by these laws that are much larger than just than just 500. You know, from from a research perspective, I think one of the challenges is also, you know, th- there's a question of, of whose vote is who's showing up and being able to cast a provisional ballot. But, you know, if we're looking at something like polling places have closed and been consolidated and there are fewer polling places and longer lines and therefore people don't vote because they don't want to stand in line. I mean, it's just a little bit, it's a challenge to sort of capture that. I mean, Dan, are there ways to measure something like the impact of longer lines at polling places um, where people just might end up not voting at all um, because it's just inconvenient? They don't have hours to wait. Yeah, this is so. This is the deterrent, the deterrent effect of these laws, right? We can measure, um, we can count the number of people who say who show up and try to vote, but we have a much harder time 
measuring the number of people who are deterred because maybe they think that the law actually goes into effect when it doesn't, or maybe they, they misunderstand it, or maybe they, they know themselves to be ineligible. And that is, that is a harder problem still. So, so what we need is um, something like an experiment that is something like a case where we can say, hey, these two precincts look very, very similar, but one of them is subject to the policy and the other is not. And since these policies are um, primarily instituted at the state level, we typically don't have that kind of leverage. So it, it becomes a very hard problem. We can start to use surveys, as many researchers do. You know, we can ask people about their experiences. Um, my colleague here at the University of Pennsylvania, Stephen Pettigrew, has done some research on waiting times and some of the, the potential deterrent effects of waiting times. But I think you are right that it is, we are, as social scientists, on much firmer ground when we are counting very specific instances, then we're trying to make inferences about what would have happened in the absence of these laws, um, particularly because in these cases, for very understandable reasons, there is no gold standard experiment because you, you can't uh, apply these policies randomly. So the message, as with a lot of what we do here at 538, is it's complicated. Don't necessarily jump to conclusions post-election day. But also, we do have broader trend data about the ways that different laws, you know, as we've discussed today, can affect voting behavior. To wrap things up, Amelia, I know a bunch of people around the country are going to actually be voting on voting laws this November 6th. So do you want to run through a couple of the, the measures that people are going to be voting on just so they're aware? Yeah, so there are a number of different ballot initiatives that have to do with voting and voter ID. There's an um, amendment in Arkansas about presenting valid photo ID. In North Carolina, this would create a constitutional requirement that voters present a photo ID to vote in person. And there are a number of other initiatives, um, including some that would make it easier to vote a measure in Florida that would restore the right to vote for people with prior felony convictions. Um, so that is a potentially big deal. And then there's also a proposal on the Michigan ballot that's been getting some attention. Um, it adds several voting policies to the Michigan Constitution, including automatic voter registration, same-day voter registration. And there are a few more, but I think those are the big ones that are worth highlighting. Can I just get in one footnote there, which is I think that It'll be very interesting to watch outcomes such as the, the North Carolina ballot measure, precisely because um, voter ID laws, at least historically, have polled pretty well that most Americans tend to say that, yes, you should present an ID when you vote. So it'll be interesting to see if that translates on, on Election Day. All right. Let's leave it there. Thank you, Amelia. Thank you. And thank you, Dan. Hey, thank you. And that's Amelia Thompson-DeVoe and Dan Hopkins, both contributors here. At 538, we'll be keeping an eye on election laws and what's going on with voting on Election Day on the live blog. Both of you are going to be on the live blog, I believe, correct? Right? Yep. Yep. And, uh, you know, maybe we can also check back in after the election. But that's it for now. My name is Galen Druk. Tony Chow is in the control room. A reminder that we are going to be putting a bunch more podcasts in this feed the next two weeks, so check back daily. You can get in touch by emailing us at podcasts at 538.com. You can also, of course, tweet at us with questions or comments. If you're a fan of the show, leave us a rating or a review in the Apple Podcast Store. When you leave a rating, it helps our rankings, which helps others discover the show. Or just tell someone about us. Thanks again for listening, and we will see you soon. 